Good evening, everyone. I invite you to take a Bible and open to Galatians, the sixth chapter this evening. That's where we'll begin, Galatians chapter six. It is a blessing to be able to be together, to have this opportunity to study from God's Word together, to be involved in this gospel meeting together. Gospel meetings are something that sort of got put on hold for the most part over the past year or so. I know the gospel meetings that I had scheduled last year were all canceled or postponed due to the pandemic, and so we're all a little bit of out of practice, maybe a little bit rusty when it comes to gospel meetings, but it certainly speaks well of you. And being here tonight to have a room full of people like this gathered with Bibles open and ready, ready to listen and join in, sing together, pray together, and study God's Word together. What a wonderful thing that is and a blessing that we have to be able to be here and it's my privilege to be able to stand before you. Again, thank you for having me, for inviting me, and, and having my family here so that we can take part in this series with you. It's so good to see some that I've known from other places who are here with us tonight, and some I've met in other places who are here. Um, Faith Head, who worships over in Salisbury, we worshiped together out in Texas, in Louisville, Texas, several years ago when I preached there. And now uh, we're able to get reacquainted with her here tonight. And uh, Spencer and Anna I met in Athens, Georgia, uh, just maybe three or four weeks ago. And I told them, you better be there when I come to the Charlotte area. And, and sure enough, they're here. And it's good to see them again. <clears throat> I want to talk to you tonight about the message of the cross. As was mentioned earlier, our theme in this series concerns how we're going to continue to trust in God during troublesome times. Well, this is how. This is how. It's going to come through the message of the cross. And as we begin to think about these things tonight, I want to start in Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians 6, in verse 14, notice what the Apostle Paul says here. He tells us that there's one thing that he would boast or glory about, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. He says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now everybody generally will find something to boast about whether it's our own accomplishments, or whether it's the accomplishments of a spouse, or maybe something that our kids have done, or even grandchildren, there's always something to boast about. We'll find something to boast about in our lives. But notice here that the Apostle Paul says there's only one thing, the only thing that he would boast about is the cross of Jesus Christ. And there are good reasons for why he would say that. But it's an interesting statement. Because a cross is not normally something to boast about. Paul's reference here to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is a reference to the death that Jesus died by crucifixion and all that that death entailed. Crucifixion was, of course, one of the most cruel and torturous methods of execution ever devised by man. 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire, this was a popular form of execution. This is what was used for the punishment of slaves, rebels against the government, despised criminals. The victim of this form of execution would be stripped of his clothing. He would be beaten severely. He would, of course, be stretched out over a wooden cross and be fastened to that cross by iron spikes that would be driven through his hands 
and his feet. He would be then suspended upright in that position and would be left to hang there for hours, sometimes even for days, until he expired. Now the purpose of crucifixion was to provide the Roman government with a very slow and a very painful and a very public and humiliating manner of execution for those who were considered to be the scum of society. So under ordinary circumstances, there would be absolutely nothing glorious about a cross by any stretch of the imagination. Glory, boasting, and crucifixion, those things just don't go together. But the cross of Christ is the exception. The reason Paul would boast about the cross of Christ is that his crucifixion went beyond the bounds of ordinary circumstances. Jesus was not a common criminal who was condemned to die for his own wrongdoing. In fact, he was the Son of God. And he willingly went to the cross even though he had done absolutely nothing wrong at any time. Notice one of the eyewitnesses, the Apostle Peter, and what he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verses 21 and 22, writing to Christians, Peter says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. He never did anything sinful. And yet he ended up on a cross. Now countless thousands of criminals and rebels were put to death by crucifixion under the rule of the Roman Empire. Thousands of them. And there is nothing glorious about that. But the crucifixion of Jesus was different from all those others. Now unfortunately, not everyone understands and appreciates the message of the cross. And Paul talks about that lack of understanding and appreciation in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where we want to focus our attention. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice what Paul says here. We're going to read verses 18 through 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The manner in which the cross of Christ is viewed in our world is well summed up in verse 18 as we go back to the beginning of what we just read. The Apostle Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. As we consider those words, Tonight, we want to think about more deeply the message of the cross. 
first, let's think about this. There is one message under consideration here. And when it comes to this one message, we notice that this is a message about certain facts. Paul summarizes the basics of this message in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice with me there, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verses 3 and 4, he says to the church in Corinth, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose from the dead. These are the essential facts of the story. But there's a lot more to it than just the acknowledgement of those three points. This message is a message about sin. As we have just noticed, Christ died for our sins. Well, what does that mean? Well, John defines what sin is for us in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. It is the breaking of God's law. When God says, don't do that, and we do it. Or when God says, you should do this, and we say, no, I won't do it. Either way is lawlessness. It is sin. And the thing about sin is that there is not one of us among those who are capable, who can say, well, I've never done that. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul plainly tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the result of that is that we become separated from God. A few chapters later in Romans 6 and verse 23, Paul goes on to say, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Separation from God, condemnation, spiritual death, that's what results from our sins. Now, unfortunately, we often have the problem that we think that sin is not a big deal. Or we think that we can somehow make up for the sins that we've committed. And so on the one hand, we don't take it seriously enough or we rationalize and we say, well, everybody does it. After all, all have sinned. We've all got our weaknesses and everybody does these things. So it's not that big of a deal if I do it too. Or we think, well, if I've sinned, then I can maybe do something good that will make up for the sin that I've committed. It's kind of like when you're in school and the teacher offers extra credit, right? Maybe I didn't do well enough on the exam. Maybe I didn't turn an assignment in on time. But now I can make up for that. If I'll do the extra credit, that'll just cancel out what I did before and, and bring things back to where they need to be. We think about that in terms of sin. Well, yes, I did something wrong, but now I'll do something right. And that'll, that'll just balance the scales for me. Well, that doesn't work. Once we've sinned, our relationship with God is destroyed. And there is nothing that we can do on our own, of our own devising, to fix that situation. The message of the cross reminds us of this because as we have noticed, what's one of the main facts of this message? 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, Christ died for our sins. But you know, the message of the cross is also a message about God's love. The message of the cross reminds us of the love that God has for mankind. Because you see, He didn't have to do anything to help us out of this miserable state of spiritual death. We often might think, well, of course God did so. Of course He sent His Son. We all know it. Did He have to? 
We're the ones with the problem. We're the ones who transgressed. We're the ones who did those things that we should not have done. God didn't have to do anything to help us. But He carried out the plan for Jesus to come and give His life for us on the cross. Why? Because His love for us is so great. Isn't that what John chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Notice the way the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5 and verse 8, he says, but God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The message of the cross is a message about how God has loved us in spite of the fact that we have made ourselves unlovable. It's a message about the sacrifice of our Savior. Now, some seem to have the idea anymore that Jesus was just like a, a martyr who died for a cause that he believed in. You know, there have been a lot of those kinds of people who have come on the scene of history from time to time and, and they've got some kind of cause and they stand up for that cause and maybe they're assassinated, maybe they're condemned and killed, murdered, whatever it may be. And so you've got these martyrs that pop up from time to time who, who have some cause that they're championing and they end up being killed as a result of it. Let me tell you something. That's not the message of the cross. That's not what Jesus is. Jesus died in order to provide a way, the only way, for our sins to be forgiven. That's why Jesus died. Now, through our own wisdom, through our own efforts, there is no way that we could find the means to remove even one sin that we've committed. The only thing that we can do is to seek to be forgiven by God for the sins that we've committed. God has always connected forgiveness of sins with the shedding of blood. Going back to the very beginning of Scripture, we see that that's so. And in Hebrews chapter 9, notice what the writer says. As we think about all those sacrifices, all those lambs that were killed under the law of Moses, all the blood that was shed, Hebrews 9 and verse 22 says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. You can't have forgiveness. You can't have remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And so the perfect sinless Son of God left heaven, came in the flesh in order to serve as the spotless sacrifice on the cross, the sacrifice that would have the power to take away sin. Hebrews 9 and verse 28, the end of that chapter, the writer goes on to say, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Jesus died to bear the sins of many. He died for our sins. He died to take away our sins. That's what this message is about. It's a message about salvation. The only thing standing between us and God is sin. That's the only problem. That's the only real issue. The message of the cross is about the fact that Jesus provides a way for that barrier between us and God to be removed. Because He offered Himself on the cross, He's opened the way of salvation to man. We've all messed up. We've all sinned. What does Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 say? But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. That's why he died. He did it for everyone. All have sinned. We all need a sacrifice. We all need salvation. Anyone can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life through the cross of Christ. The message is that He has already done the hard part. And now we simply need to come to Him on His terms for forgiveness. Hebrews 5 and verse 9, speaking of Jesus, the inspired writer says, and having been perfected, He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Those are the people who are going to be saved as a result of the message of the cross. The ones who obey Him. But we need to understand also that when we think about this message of the cross, that it is, along with all of the things that we have just mentioned, it's also a message about condemnation. And while the message of the cross opens the way of salvation to those who come to Christ for forgiveness, at the same time, it excludes those who refuse to believe and those who refuse to obey. Going back to John chapter 8, we notice that even when Jesus was on the earth, He made this point. In John 8 and verse 24, Jesus speaking to the Jews on this occasion in Jerusalem, He said, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. There is no hope of salvation outside the message of the cross. There is no way to get rid of your sins there is no way to receive forgiveness. There is no way to go to heaven. There is no way for everything to somehow work out in the end outside the message of the cross. You remember what Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. And so the message of the cross, as much as it is a message of salvation, it is also at the same time a message of condemnation. Because while it welcomes any who will come to obey the Gospel of Christ, to be saved through the blood of Christ, it excludes from salvation those who refuse and reject the message. Now, having looked at this. All of that and more is contained in this one message. But now let's notice as we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that Paul points out that there are two types of people. Two types of people. Notice again what we read in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. First, there are those who are perishing. Notice again here, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now why are they perishing? Now remember, the only thing that would cause a person to perish is sin. Sin is what separates us from God. If someone is perishing, it's because he or she has committed sin and remains guilty of that sin. Back in Isaiah chapter 59, the prophet Isaiah in verses 1 and 2 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. Isaiah is answering the question, what's the problem? Why is God not listening to us? Why, what's happened to our relationship with Him? Well, the answer is simple. Sin. Your sins have hidden His face from you. That's what's caused this disruption 
this barrier between you and God. And it makes no difference if the sin under discussion is sexual immorality or lying or drinking intoxicating drink or drug abuse or if it's murder or if it's stealing or if it's hatred or jealousy. It doesn't make any difference what sin is. You know, we like to categorize sin. Some are really bad and some are not so bad. And usually the ones that you're committing are really bad. And the ones that I'm committing, those are the ones that are not so bad. Well, it doesn't make any difference what sin, which sin it happens to be. Sin separates us from God. All those who stand guilty of sin stand condemned before God. Now, Christ offers peace with God through the cross, but if you're not willing to come to Him on His terms for forgiveness, then you are perishing. Think about your friends. Think about your neighbors. Think about your co-workers, people that you go to school with. How many of them are perishing. Can you think of some names? Can you picture some faces of people you know who are perishing because of this very thing? What will become of those that are perishing? To perish is to face destruction. Those who reject the message of the cross are destined to face everlasting destruction. Look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 for a moment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And notice what Paul says here in verses 8 and 9. He speaks here in writing to the church in Thessalonica of Jesus' return. Jesus is going to come again. And when He comes, Paul says in verses 8 and 9, He's going to come taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That's what's going to happen to those that are perishing. The people who refuse to believe. The people who refuse to obey the Gospel. The people who say, well, that's fine. I know that Jesus is Lord, but I don't need to get baptized. I don't see any point in that. I don't need to really stop my sin. God will understand. This is the outcome. This is the outcome. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, it's described like this. John says in Revelation 21 and verse 8 that the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's perishing. That's ultimately the outcome for those who are perishing. Separation from God. Punishment for eternity. And so, there are those who are perishing. The second, the second type of person falls into the category of the saved. There are those who are being saved. As we look again at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It's the power of God. Well, why are they being saved? Here we've got those that are perishing. We've just talked about why they're perishing. They're, they're in the guilt of their sins and they refuse to believe and obey the Gospel. But what about these that are being saved? Why are they being saved? Christ opened the way of salvation to everyone when His blood was shed on the cross. Romans 5, 8, and 9, but God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by His blood, we should be saved from wrath through Him. Jesus died. His blood was shed for everyone to provide salvation. And we stop and we think, well, if He died for everybody, shouldn't everybody automatically be saved? No. 
there are conditions that we must meet in order to have the forgiveness and the salvation that Jesus has made available. What are those conditions? Well, when we get to the end of Mark's Gospel, after Jesus died and rose again, in Mark 16 and verse 16, we have the Lord recorded as saying, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Somebody says, well, yeah, but you don't really have to get baptized. I mean, it doesn't say, it doesn't say he who does not believe and does not get baptized will be condemned. Well, you don't have to not believe and not be baptized to be condemned. You don't believe, you're condemned. It doesn't matter what else you do after that. But what do you have to do to be saved? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. In Acts chapter 2, we see that message carried out on the day of Pentecost, shortly after Jesus ascended back to the Father in heaven, the apostles preached the message of the cross. In Acts 2 and verse 38, when the people wanted to know what they needed to do to be saved, Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Conditions. Conditions. You see the conditions? If you want what the Lord offers, if you want the salvation that's available through the blood of Christ, what do you have to do? Well, there's certain conditions you have to comply with. Not only must you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died for you on the cross to take away your sins, but you've got to repent. You've got to turn away from your sins and be baptized, be immersed in water in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And so we think about, well, there, there are these people who are saved. Why are they saved? These are the ones who meet the Lord's terms for salvation. That's why they're being saved. What will become of those who are being saved? To be saved is to be delivered from destruction. Those who are saved are destined for eternity in heaven. In Philippians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21, Paul writing to the saved, writing to the church in Philippi, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. In light of the message of the cross, every person, is either perishing or saved. Every person is either headed for the lake of fire or is headed for a home in heaven. There are two types of people in this world. Now, let's also notice that there are two responses to the message of the cross. Two responses as we go again to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, we find that the first response is that it is foolishness. Look again at 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Why do they view the message of the cross as foolishness? Well, they don't understand it. They don't appreciate it. They don't see any worth in it. I have two older brothers. And back when we were all still living at home, I don't know if you've ever heard of a stereo grand picture. Have you ever seen one of these things? But one night I came home, I think I'd been at work or, or school or somewhere, and I came in, I came in the living room, my brother Jimmy, was sitting there on the living room floor leaning up against the couch and he had this framed poster that looked just like this. Here's a picture of, of the exact same thing. And he's sitting there in the middle of the living room floor and he's just staring at this thing. And I looked at it and it looked like that and I thought, what is he? It's just a bunch of squiggly lines here and he's got it framed and he looks up at me and he says, I don't even know if he looked up at me. I think he was still staring at me. He said, isn't this great? 
I got this for 20 bucks at the mall. And I looked at it and I thought, you paid 20 bucks for that? <laughs> and it's this framed picture, and it, and it said, it had this caption at the bottom, Guardians of the Deep. And he's sitting there staring at that thing. He says, this is amazing. you got to see this. And I'm thinking, it's just a bunch of garbage that he wasted his money on, right? And then finally he turns it to me and he says, look at this, stare at this. And I start looking at it and, and I stare at it and, and I, my eyes start to go cross and I start to get a headache. And then finally, boom, there it is. In that, all of a sudden, there's a sunken ship and there's this three-dimensional images, these sharks that are swimming around and there's a treasure chest there and it, it's almost like you can just reach in and grab it and then of course I blinked and it was gone. And, you know, you have to start the whole process over. But I finally saw in it what he had seen. And it wasn't foolishness at that point in you see, this is what happens with the message of the cross. There is something incredible there. There is something amazing there. There's something that is so valuable there. But if you don't see any worth in it, it just looks like a bunch of foolishness. Many people, whether they admit it or not, they view the death of Jesus Christ on the cross as the outdated story of an irrelevant person who lived too long ago to matter and who died a death so violent that it just isn't even pleasant to think about. It's just foolishness. And many of those who are perishing, the truth is, they don't want to understand it. Don't want to see the value in it. Don't want to come to appreciate it. Many of them want to sin and don't want anyone to tell them that they need to stop the sin and change. And it seems foolish to even consider all this stuff about sin and salvation and forgiveness when you're enjoying a life of fornication and drunkenness and irreverence and selfish pleasure. Why do I want to be bothered with any of this stuff about Christ dying on the cross when I'm enjoying all of that? It's just foolishness. And then you have those people. It's always interesting to me. You have those people who go on about their lives as though they're just going to live here forever. I don't need to think about eternity. I don't need to think about what happens when I die. You know, I don't have time to consider the message of the cross. I don't have time to worship God. You know, I'm busy. I'm doing other things. I'm making money and I'm getting rich and I'm having a good time and I'm doing all these different things. I don't have time for that. Well, that might work out all right if you could cheat death. You know, you remember what old Ben Franklin said, right? Two things that you can't avoid, death and taxes, right? Well, that's good. But you know, before Ben Franklin ever said that, what did the, what did the writer of Hebrews say in Hebrews 9 and verse 27? It's appointed to men to die once. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Nobody's going to cheat death. Whether they are willing to admit it or not, much of the world looks at the story of this suffering Savior and dismisses this story the way the Bible presents it as absolute foolishness. That's one possible response to the message of the cross. And it's a common one. It's a common one. But there's a second possible response, and that is that it's viewed as being the power of God. As we look again at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 18, one more time, Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power 
of God. Why do the saved view the message of the cross as being the power of God? Well, the saved recognize the message for what it really is. The saved recognize that through the cross, God has reached out to his helpless and hopeless creation in order to offer us forgiveness and hope. There is great power in that message. Over in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says this about it. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. It is obvious that most religious people most religious people have given up on the idea that the message of the cross is God's power to save. You know how I know that they've given up on that idea? You think, well, all these people out here, all these, I mean, I don't know how many church buildings we've passed on the way here. There's a lot of religious people around here. They have given up on the message of the cross being God's power to save. You know how we know that? When you see religious groups advertising and using entertainment to draw people, food and, and fun and frolic to try and bring in the crowds, using all those kinds of methods and means, advertising all kinds of you know, fun programs and entertaining things and recreation and, and here's something for your kids that's going to be fun for them. Using all of those things to draw in the crowds, when you see that, you know they have given up on the power of the message of the cross. None of those things are God's power to save. I don't care how, I don't care how well you entertain people. I don't care how much recreation you provide. I don't care how fun it is when the crowds come in and enjoy it. None of those things are God's power to save. But the message of the cross is. Because the message of the cross tells us what Christ did for us and it tells us how we can be reconciled to God through Him. And let me tell you something, at the end of it all, that's the only thing that matters. Well, if the message of the cross... If the message of the cross is viewed as foolishness by those who are perishing. Is it, is it lacking that power when they're viewing it? No. That's not the problem. God's message has the power whether we accept it or reject it. The simple fact is that you will not benefit from its power if you don't make proper use of it of it. You know, it's just like that treadmill, that exercise bike, that piece of exercise equipment, right, that's over there in the corner. You bought it with good intentions. I know you did. And now it's a place to hang clothes and towels and, you know, whatever else. You don't have anywhere else to put it. It goes there. Uh, you know, it's just a big hunk of metal now that you want to get rid of. But you know what? If you clear all that stuff off of it and put it to use, it's probably just as good as it ever was for the purpose that it was intended to serve. The message of the cross is just as powerful as it has always been. It's just as powerful as it was back there on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when those people cried out, Men and brethren, what should we do? And they were told to repent and be baptized. And about 3,000 of them were baptized that day. Why? Because they were convicted by the power of God, the message of the cross. It's just as powerful as it was as we read in Acts chapter 8 when Philip was teaching that Ethiopian eunuch as they were riding down the road in the chariot and the man commanded the chariot to stand still. 
He had said to Philip, what hinders me from being baptized? The message got through. It's powerful. It's just as powerful now as it was on that occasion. It's just as powerful as it was when Saul of Tarsus, who had been making havoc of the church in Jerusalem and who had been persecuting the saints and dragging them off to prison, it's just as powerful now as it was when he was told, after being confronted by the risen Lord, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And he did it. He did it. Just as powerful now as it was then. The power of God is still there in that old message of the cross for those who want to be saved. What about you tonight? as we've thought about these things. How do you view the message of the cross? Are you like those who look at it and say, ah, it's just a bunch of foolishness. Maybe I'll deal with that later. Or, are you those who see it as the power of God? Is it just some old irrelevant foolishness that somebody concocted a long time ago or do you see the power of God in that message? And if so, what are you going to do with it? Will you convince others, persuade others that the power of God is in that message of the cross? Will you, if you're in need of salvation tonight, respond to the message of the cross? We've already read how this is a message that contains conditions that must be met in order for one to receive salvation. Jesus went to the cross. He suffered that torturous, humiliating, cruel death. His blood was shed to cleanse you of your sins. Will you take advantage tonight if that's your need? Will you turn from your sins and be buried with Christ in baptism tonight? We invite you to do that if that's what you need to do. But if you've already done that, and you recognize that as a child of God, your sin separates you from God. You haven't been living as a follower of Christ should. Maybe your attitudes have been wrong. Maybe you've been engaged in some actions that you shouldn't be involved in. Whatever the case may be, if there's something that needs to be corrected, let's make sure we get that corrected before we leave here tonight. If we can help you and assist you with those spiritual needs, we invite you now to come down to the front while we stand and as we sing.